Welcome back, everybody. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex. And, you know, as always, I want to thank you for taking the time to hang out. You know, truly do appreciate it. Once again, I've got my buddy Rodney Medina with me. Rodney, how you doing today, man? I'm, I'm very fine. Thank you, Alex. It's good to see you, man. Good, good to see you, man. It's been a while. Been yeah, a while. it has been. It's been a, it's a, a strange while, right? Because, you know, this last year has been very uh, uh, heightening for the census. Uh, yeah. And uh, something that we haven't gone through in over a hundred years and we're survivors and we're happy to be here we're uh, thankful that uh, you know things are starting to get back to normal hopefully we don't screw it up and uh, you know I think that's that one thing is is to be thankful that we're you know we're all good yeah it's all moving forward we're all getting vaccinated so I, I appreciate the little jar of a uh, homegirl you brought out bro yeah this is uh just wanted to show you what I've been up to or this, this looks really nice, everybody. He did a really great job. Smells good, too. Don't you? Uh, has that nice little lemony, musky, funky. And you say it's a mystery plant? It's a mystery plant. It popped up underneath one of the other plants that uh, had grown uh, from the previous year. And it just popped up on its own at the almost at the end of the cycle when I was ready to harvest. This thing popped up. Oh, wow. So oh. I just grew her out and female. That, that, that's awesome, yeah, man. That came yeah. out bitching. Yeah, so right it was... On. Uh, no name right but, on you know we love them all the same all right so um let's see all right well what are we going to get into let's get into uh, the report from the cannabis front line and today we're going to start with uh, an article that came out well you know came out in high times but it's about the um the dea seizure let's see the article's entitled dea reports show marijuana arrest and seizures up in 2020 and um, this report came out in a couple of articles, man. Yeah, so, but, I mean, just think of the name alone. Domestic Cannabis er Eradication Suppression Program. Uh, you know, it, it, just the title alone indicates how out of step and out of touch and outdated the federal gov government is regarding cannabis, right? So they're, they're still on this mission to suppress the plant any way they can although the states are doing their own thing but it's just it's 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 a waste of a lot of energy of course um i understand why they want to do it a regulated farm is what we all like because we want our medicine to be safe for the patients but um it's just we're still in that you know that little quandary of an area where where um we can't do things to the fullest extent so that we can be doing the right thing for what the plant has to offer yeah and the really crazy thing what really always trips me out is the fact that like i don't know 60 70 percent of the seizures are in california and I, you know i had heard that part of the reason for that is because since it is legal here um that growing especially like on public land mm -hmm. it's no longer Easier. it's it's a misdemeanor oh you know it's a misdemeanor so so those guys who would put plants up in the Los Padres National yeah, Forest exactly, and uh, camp there. Now it's just a misdemeanor. Now it's just a misdemeanor. If they get caught. Right, if they get caught. Sometimes you know? they find the grow, not, not the people. Exactly, you know, so, and I, you know, I don't know if that's, but why only in California? It's not like California is the only one that has well, national parks. Right, true, but California does have the optimal weather to be able to grow well, at, at, you know, yeah. on, on, on year round pretty much. Yeah, You're not going to do that in Oklahoma. Well, no, because I was wondering, like, you know, let's say in, in Oregon. But, yeah, it does get pretty wet up there, though, too. Sure, yeah, sure. It does. So California has optimal, you know, optimal growing, I would think, in anywhere other than Hawaii. Uh, uh, Ooh, I like for, Hawaii. Yeah, so, yeah. But, well, and, you know, and we were talking, and, and what, what they kind of hide at the bottom is the fact that you know, in the last 10 years, those seizures are cut in half just about. You know, they said they eradicated last year in 2020, something like f over 4 million plants, 4.5 million. But in like 2011, they eradicated like 8.7 million plants. So, I mean, we got to, you know, we at least have to look at the fact that in 10 years, we've made some progress. Sure. You know, um, and again... It, and there's probably more being grown right now than there was back then. Oh, I, I bet there is, dude. I bet there is. Because, again, it's um, it's a misdemeanor now out here in California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how how is it that um, it isn't attractive for cartels or, or uh, you know, just people trying to grow 
you know, black market, gray market. Sure. I don't know if there is a gray market anymore. <clears throat> I don't think so. It's, it's either it's, black or white. Black or white now. Yeah. yeah. Or, or uh, legacy. I like to call it legacy market. Yep. That um, too. Uh, but you know that the 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 legacy market is always going to exist, and it's going to exist. Period. But because the states like California overtax, overmanage the pro, in in some in most cases for our safety. But when you're slapping a thirty percent tax on top of cannabis already for you know that's sold in a dispensary that's already 30 percent less that you're gonna than the legacy guy is gonna make oh, yeah, selling that yeah. cannabis so um until that goes down you're all that legacy market's just gonna be there and always be a, a and pose pose a pose that competition for for the legal market well you know and, and the other thing that also recently that keeps the legacy market just so flush with customers is that I was talking about this last week, is that every so often, every like two or three years, the conversation around cannabis, you know, around for lawmakers, um, is this idea of putting in THC caps on flour or cannabis products. Caps. You know, caps, yeah. Okay. Yeah, limits, yeah. Right. Yeah, limits. And which doesn't really go to serve anybody but the black market because especially for the low limits or the low caps that some states are asking for. I think Vermont asked for like, 10% cap THC on flour and 30% cap on edibles or concentrates. I mean, yeah, you're, you're just handing over people. You're just handing everything back over to the black market. Sure. But they don't have caps and people still want those products. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, how are you, how do you expect any kind of market to really thrive under those kind of restrictions? You know? Yeah. So a lot of work still to do, man. A lot of work still to do, but um, at least they're, you know, eradicating less than they were 10 years ago. Yeah, and uh, I also saw that Representative Dave Joyce, Ohio Republican, this week introduced a uh, legislation to end the long-standing federal prohibition of cannabis um, to Republicans. And it would basically remove, I mean, this is what we always want. I don't know how far this will go, but the bill would remove cannabis from the, from the uh, controlled substance list. And uh, they would create that regu regulatory framework for, for cannabis, just similar to the alcohol industry. That's, that's their bill, basically. They don't touch on any social e equity issues, of course, but um, we'll see how far that goes. And um, I'm really disappointed in how far it hasn't gone, but I think we all are, and it's almost understood. Hey, so, you know, do you think that the federal government should, once it allows for for legalization of cannabis do you think they should be the ones to impose social equity into those programs or should we leave it up to each state well when you leave it up take california we're a microcosm of what the country could look like because we're a patchwork of legal the patchwork of legal legality throughout the state with all the different municipalities um, if you leave social equity up to each individual municipality they'll just not incorporate it or they, it'll be different and I, I can see where that could be perhaps be beneficial for certain communities because of the difference, the difference in needs, right? So, yeah, well, but, that, that was my question because, I mean, to have something, I mean, what would a blanket federal, you know, social equity for cannabis look like, really? Because, I mean... You I've would heard, have it, programs. You would have incubator you know? programs like, like the Small Business Administration does. You, you have uh, an ability to, I mean, if you take a look at social equity for what it's supposed to represent is giving people of color or just minorities, which include women or, uh, uh, cannabis felons, uh, the ability to enter the market a little easier, right? If mm -hmm. they have that knowledge sure. and they have that, that history, let them be able or, or get into the, enable them to get into the market easier. So programs, programs that would support that. And what does programs mean? It would be financial it would be financial help. So yeah, at um, least that, you know, if there's a budget, allocate a certain amount to address social equity issues. And we don't know what that looks like yet. We know we we know what we know what the concept is, but there's nobody who is uh who's gotten it right who, yet. No, there's yeah, there's nobody who's gotten it right yet. So it's it's something that's ever changing as far as I can see. And every step is important, but there is no there is no blanket answer for social equity because every community is different and has different needs. Yeah, because I was wondering about that. I was thinking about it and I was like, I mean, you know, does the federal government really know better than, you know, state by state where the 
social equity or, or where the social harm actually wound up. Right. And it may be something as simple as uh, requiring the municipalities to allocate a certain amount of their tax revenue oh, sure. to sure, go to sure. social equity programs and let them determine, just like uh, like how uh, banks are, do programs like this, uh, fiscal responsibility, and if they if they spend so much money in a community, they want to teach fiscal responsibility. They're 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 praised because they have they're taking that budget and doing something positive for the community. Same thing with social equity. Just re require them to allocate a certain part of the budget. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. And hopefully we can trust the people who get that. Get wow, that budget. You know, that's the thing, right? No one's incorruptible. But um, all right. Yeah. So um, our next story is uh, it's kind of a trip because, I mean, we all knew it was coming, right? Uh, alcohol, tobacco, getting into the cannabis game. But what was sure. that going to look like? You know, and last year, PBR, Paps Blue Ribbon, not pro bull riding, but uh, PBR, Paps Blue Ribbon, uh, <laughs> they came out with um, a hard seltzer, but a THC infused hard seltzer. Mm -hmm. um, at first, it came out, uh, it was only 5% THC last year, and I believe it only came in like a lemon or a citrus flavor. Um, but this year, you know, they're going big. They're going to up that to 10% THC, which would be kind of cool, man. You know, I, I, I try them. You know, they have new flavors, a, a mango, I think a strawberry. I'm a big fan of mango. Bro. Mm -hmm. And that I know in Spanish that sounds dirty, but. Uh, yeah, big that, fan of mango? <laughs> I'm a big <laughs> fan of mango. But um, <laughs> anyways, yeah. So, um, but they're available only in dispensaries and only in, in California. Yeah. you. Know, I, I'm surprised at how many drinks I see in those dispensaries. <laughs> and I know they're federally illegal, correct? I mean, mm -hmm. they are complete. The, yeah. the, the Federal Drug Administration has not, they're, they're, you cannot be selling those. And technically, federally, well, you can't be. You can't be using it either. You can't be using cannabis either. But those drinks are just, they're rolling out like Coca Cola's, they're man. Rolling out, and you know what? And they're being pretty careful about it. You know, no one's really trying to mix alcohol and THC with it. No, I, that would be a uh, bad idea. <laughs> well, I, I think that just draws too much attention and people just get, I mean, people just get way too fucked up. Yeah. Think, yeah, know? they just, do. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I haven't had a drink other than CBD water and CBD infused uh, fruit juices or drinks bottled. I haven't had any of the like the PBR or anything like that, so I'm interested to see how how what that effect would be, what that high is. Is it a high? Is it you know? Is it is it like doing an edible? Obviously, I guess. You know, well, I mean, processing first, through the liver. First of all, it's ten milligrams, so I don't know if I don't know how much you consume, but I don't feel ten milligrams that sure. much. Um, I have tried some of the infused drinks again, but they're only capped out at ten milligrams, so. And, you know, they're really small. I think sure. the one was canna, canna something. Everything's got canna in front mm -hmm. of it. Um, but it was okay. You know, um, it seems like a lot of people, a, a lot of these drinks are drifting or, or, or are like a citrus or lemon flavor, either mm -hmm. because they can't get that cannabis taste out of it. I'm not sure, man, what it is. Sure. And but, citrus is strong. It's, 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 it can be overwhelming yeah. and take control of, the, uh, of that taste. Now, um, but yeah, for me, I, I, I need something a little stronger. I'm waiting to see how these PBR, um, I don't know, but 10 milligrams, again, I, I'd have to drink quite a few of them. Sure. Um, but for the, you know, everybody else regular, what they call, you know, joy bangers, tourists, just people who are visiting the cannabis scene, I'm sure it's fucking great. Sure. And that's what yeah. you have to think about the mass, the masses. Is it, is it good for them? Does it relax them? Does it get them, you know, do they get a good vibe after drinking one or two, uh, what's the harm but now what i wonder is hopefully they'll allow for drinks to have a higher thc milligram count kind of the way alcohol drinks are tiered that way too you know because you have your light beer on one side and then you've got your you know really harder you know like we were saying what are these, um, you know, like a hard seltzer, but with alcohol, you know, with the higher, you know, six, 8% instead of like a 4% alcohol mm -hmm. per count. So, um, concentrated yeah. shots of THC hey, that you can add to, that, to your drink. That'd be cool, man. You know, that'd be, uh, yeah. what that look like? Right. Take a shot, take a shot of THC. Yeah. You just, you just need, you, you need it. Um, 
You need to kick your drink up a little you know, bit. Measure it out. Yeah, I'm down. Can you do that? I mean, they you love. Could. They, you they love. They love to regulate things. They can regulate. They it can so. regulate. <laughs> they can tax it. They'll find a way to tax it. All right, and now uh, this last story comes out of uh, MJ Biz Daily, um, and it it goes to just the craze of Delta Eight THC, um, and how the CBD market. And just manufacturers really drifted in the past two years, probably, towards putting Delta 8 THC into products. Now, if you don't know what Delta 8 THC is, um, from how I understand it, and I'm not a scientist, it is like TH, like Delta 9 THC, which is probably the most uh, psychoactive component in cannabis. You know, but um, Delta 8 is synthesized from CBD. You have to chemically make it. It's not something that's in abundance in CBD or hemp or cannabis itself. Um, but a lot of products in the past couple of years have come out with this other kind of psychoactive, this, this Delta-8. Now, it's not as heavy as Delta-9, but it is there. You still feel it. You still feel it. So, yeah, we're going to test the farm bill because, you know, it says that anything derived from hemp is no longer part of the Controlled Substance Act. Um, but it isn't something that is naturally found in hemp and cannabis in those amounts. Not the amounts that would be Not useful and can be put into products. Yeah, because, I mean, there you can find Delta-8, Delta-10, THC in hemp, but in really small amounts. And if you're going to, you know, pull it out, extract it naturally, you're going to need a lot of hemp. And it's then the price of that Delta-8 just goes, just skyrockets. So without synthesizing or making it chemically... You're not going to get any big amounts. And that's where uh, the trouble lies. Because according to the DEA, anything that is synthesized from cannabis is still considered part of the Controlled Substance Act. And uh, yeah, I think someone, uh, yeah, I think, I honestly think this Delta 8, even Delta 10, that's another, you know, THC that's in cannabis that they're synthesizing also. Uh, they're going to, you know, someone is going to take the government to court or vice versa. The government's going to take somebody to court and they're going to fight it. And we're going to find out just the extent of what that definition is of what is actually allowed under the farm bill. Mm -hmm. You know, because even when it came out, I always said, I always, because when I read it, it says any cannabinoid derived from hemp is no longer, it didn't say anything but THC. So my question was always, if I derive 100 milligrams of THC from hemp, as long as I can certify that it's from hemp, it shouldn't be illegal. That's my thinking. But again, I don't know anybody who wants to get a lawyer and put that to the test. I, I would if I had the money. It will come about. And I think that those exercises, it's good for cannabis. You know, as, as much as we are all a fan of the industry, sometimes cannabis does get ahead of itself with all, introducing all of these new products when there's, uh, you know, the most of... The general public doesn't even know the basics of what we, what basics we of Delta of, of, nine, yeah, Delta you know? nine, and now we're introducing these other, uh, not only cannabinoids, um, but now these these synthesized versions of of of, of a cannabinoid, right? So it, but we have can't advocates and 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 law and and the lawsuits have to happen, yeah. Because lawmakers need to know how big this the scope of this plant is, right? That's true. <clears throat> it's it's we know the the sixty thousand different products that you can create out of hemp and, and cannabis. We know the power of it, but they're they, they need to really understand. I'm sure they do, but they need to understand how we do know what the potential of it is, and they have to start addressing these things uh, in a bigger scope so that we can really make those. They owe us a hundred years of research and development. Man. Oh man, I know, right? Hundred years. Imagine if we had a hundred years of research of development in of this plant. Um, we would have already known that by now. We, we would have. There's things. You know, and, there's things we won't know for another ten years or fifteen years. You know, and you make a good point. I mean, we in the industry we're, we're barely getting our minds around um, Delta Nine, you know, and starting to educate people on that. 
And now we're going to introduce all these other psychoactives to the general public who, especially if they're marketed under CBD, who right. up until now, people, you know, people have been telling them, no, CBD is not, not psychoactive. You're not going to get high. It's great. But, but this comes from CBD. But this comes from <laughs> CBD. And then you start seeing CBD products plus Delta 8. And sure. people think they may think it's, it's innocuous. It's not going to affect them. And then all of a sudden they feel high and now all this confusion comes in again. Sure. And then... What I trip out on is, or what I really started to think about is the same kind of miseducation, but if you're a parent and you're wanting to give it to your kid, again, you go, you're, if you're going from a just a CBD product to a CBD plus Delta 8 or enhanced Delta 8 or Delta 10, all these other, you know, compounds, I mean, yeah, how do you do that at effectively or how do you do that with some kind of security that you know what you're giving a kid somebody under under age and the, and now you have easier accessibility for people under age because now it's it's very convenient it's in a can well and or in you a know bottle. What? and it's just again without the without the education it just creates more confusion because as it is people who are new to cannabis and even new to hemp and cbd always ask that first question is will it get me high well, exactly so now the question is well this CBD with Delta 8 will. So, okay, so now we have to differentiate for right. them, you know, yeah. and now the education, which is fine. I'm all for educating people. You know, yeah, let's educate them, but it's, you know, for, for the regular shopper, they're, they just want to pick something up. Sure. You know. Um, and even even just picking something up, there's a wide, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a spectrum of, of details in there that they're going to take into consideration when when they start dosing well, yeah, their product. Yeah, absolutely. Because already, already, without already, having yeah, thinking of Delta A, without having to think about Delta A, CBGM you know, and CB. Well, it's it's also you know THCA. And then how much of the how much of those cannabinoids are in your product? Because one thing that people ask me also is why is some CBD tinctures more expensive than others? I'm like, well, you have to look at how many milligrams of CBD are in each one. You know, you you may find a gas station CBD for 15 bucks that's an ounce. And then you go to a shop and you find same, you know, an, same size of CBD oil. Uh, but now it's 60, 80 bucks. And you're wondering, well, what's the difference? You know, one is where it's sourced and two is is what the CBD count is, what the mm -hmm. percentage is, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, like you said, now we've got to, okay, well, what's Delta 8? Well, ah, fuck. Okay, well, we, someone needs to make a pamphlet. <laughs> a pamphlet with each can. Yeah. <laughs> That's some expensive packaging. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, um, and, and there's still a lot of states, and a lot of states are really coming down hard on these type of products, too. They're, they're putting the brakes on them until, again, these lawsuits go through. Well, if you don't know, again, even Delta A being so so new, and you need to understand the processes of, at which how these, you know, how that Delta Eight is being manufactured. I'm sure there's a wide variety of ways to do it, um, uh, but you need credible and still safe products. Yeah, it still needs to be tested, you know, and then also now you've got legal weed. The the, the, the legal industry just really protesting it because since it does come from cbd um there are less testing that needs to be done for cbd but yet you're still getting a high so the legal cannabis markets are like well wait how are how why are we so special just because we have delta nine but yet you're going to allow less testing and less regulation for delta eight and cbd products sure you know it's not a level playing field and they have a point i can see the point you know, I can see the point as far as just the cost of doing business, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting how these, uh, this all shakes out with these other deltas, you know, other delta THCs. Uh, brothers and sisters, and that was the report from the Cannabis Frontline. And it was sponsored by Cannabis by the Sea magazine. Go over to cbtsmagazine.com to download your free digital copy. All right, now we're going to talk about the cannabis plant in the vegetative stage. And this is uh, this is the stage right after the seedling stage. You know, um, plant usually stays about three, maybe four weeks. You should have about, you know, five, maybe four or five, you know, sets of leaves, which is, you know, leaf on either side. And by then, you know, your plant's in vegetative stage. Um, this is the stage where all of the main growth happens. You know, this is where your plant starts growing in all directions, taller, wider, you know, um, that's when the root system gets built. That's when all of the the all of your branches, 
you know, they get nice and strong, you know, to hold up the flower by the time that way, by the time flowering starts, if you're growing outside, by the time flowering starts, you know, September, late August, you know, you, your, your plant's not going to fall over. You're not going to have to stake it as much. Unless you're Rodney right here, which is because he's growing autos. But typically, you know, um, cannabis plants are photo period, which means that they use the different light cycles from the seasons to move through their stages of growth. And for a cannabis plant to just maintain um, vegetative growth, you need at least 16 hours of light. Um, industry standards, 18 hours of lights on, six hours off. You can get absolutely really massive vigorous growth if you leave your lights on 24 hours. But you know what? Everything's alive, dude. Everything. I like everything. The rest. Everything needs sleep. Come on, man. How you can keep sure. your lights on 24 hours? Poor thing. <clears throat> Grow some hyper weed. Oh, you can. You can. And, you know, if, if you keep that light cycle going, you can keep a plant in veg for a couple of years, you know, just mother it, you know, just clip clones off of it. Um, but, yeah, really, the light cycle is really what keeps it in that state. Um, now let's talk a little bit about wa watering. Oh, choked on that. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about watering during vegetative, uh, stage. So it's going to take more water, but that doesn't mean that every time you water, you have to feed your plant. Um, especially if you're bottle, if you're feeding a bottle of nutrients, you probably only have to feed once a week. Of um, the nutrients. Of the nutrients. Yeah, okay. yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, in, like for me in the summertime, you know, I live up in Ohio. It gets hot up there. I'll water maybe every two days, every three days just mm -hmm. because the plants are just transpiring, which means they're just, you know, breathing and perspiring, you know, and they need more more water. Um, but I do not feed every time because then it just overloads them and you burn your plant and that causes all kinds of other issues. How much time after you, while it's in the vegetative state, do you start – feeding the plants because obviously you, you started out in soil that's rich in nutrients and then that starts to degrade at what point do you start feeding your plants the the uh... so typically a soil when it, when i transplant my plants typically because i use a recipe 420 it'll it'll feed the plant for about three to four weeks and then from there i'll start feeding it either um even if it's not fully gone through all the nutrients in the soil a little bump up in, in nutrients, you know, really kind of helps it. Um, I'll, I'll feed it a mixture of um, fish emulsion, uh, liquid fish emulsion, mm -hmm. with a little bit of um, um, molasses, just to kind of throw in that sugar. They have that premix. I, I, I was able to find that premix. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it smells yeah, like yeah. fish. Yeah, exactly. If you can find one that has all that together, mm -hmm. you know, the fish, the kelp. Mm -hmm. And the and the molasses, you're doing good, man. That's that's mm -hmm. the one you feed again, just once a week. And I like that because it's it's really low in the, the amount of nutrients. It's usually like a two 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 NPK, you know, nitrogen, uh, potassium, phosphate, or a five five five. You know, it's not going to burn your plants. What does the molasses do? The molasses adds a sugar. It's called the uh, it adds what's called the bricks count. So the the sugars help build. You know, uh, helps the structures in the plants, but when it's flowering, it also helps build the the, the trichomes. Okay. You know, so, so the, it sets the, the sets the basis for the the foundation for the trichomes, or helps do that. It, it helps. It helps. Yeah, it really does. And uh, yeah, because sugars are important. You know, your plant mm -hmm. needs needs the sugar to create you know different amino acids, you know, different things. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so <laughs> plant has a lot of responsibilities. <laughs> well, it has you, a high bar to, it has a high bar for itself to come out looking, smelling, uh, great. Well, and that's the thing though, too, is that I, I wanted to mention is that as soon as your plant moves into the vegetative stage, it's going to need a lot more attention from you. Sure. You know, it, it's not just, um, cause once, cause it's in a seed leaf, it's going kind of on autopilot. Yeah. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> right now, the plant I have here is, you know, what, seven inches tall, but now I can see I have to spend time with it because two days ago I came out and I was just you know, feeling her leaves. Little moth flew away. Okay, and here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. It's on now. Yeah. Um, so now I have to be more uh, conscientious of, of real, I mean, be more conscientious and look under the leaves and check out the soil. I don't want anything uh, forming in the soil that could be problematic. So it, it, it does that, that vegetative state is the most exciting. <clears throat> You know, this, that last plant, one of these plants 
that it may be this one here. Remember the one you, you told me we were doing a, a, a podcast here and you said that one is, uh, it was already beginning to flower and it was, it was really small like that. And you had me f- force it in back into the vegetative oh, yeah. slate by, yeah. w- with, with 24 hours of light, which I did for 10 days and boy, she turned crazy. Yeah. One leaf would grow out and, you know, instead of, instead of the standard, uh, five. Yeah, you, yeah, you three did. would grow out, and I would just pluck them off. I go, "You're a waste. You're a waste." You know, and yeah, put you, it, put yeah, it the, aside. yeah. When you, uh, when <laughs> but you, she went crazy, man. When, when you revert plants, you know, hormonally, dude, they're tripping out. They're yeah. like, "Well, what the hell?" And yeah. they'll throw out these really strange leaves. Either one leaf blade, patterns. either one blade leaf, <clears throat> or three blade leaves, but one's crooked, and you're like, "Oh fuck, what am I doing?" When you grow a plant, and hopefully everybody out there uh, will get to the point where you, because it's been just. I do it just for the love of doing it, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. And the symmetry in the beginning is so incredible. When you look right over the plant, everything's perfectly yeah. symmetrical. And not that one. <laughs> oh, no. When I uh, forced her back, it took a while, oh, she yeah. went crazy, man. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was fun to watch the two side by side growing. Yeah. And I, they, they, they were mates. Uh, they just, they grew together and they were uh, harvested together. And that's one of them. And that may be the one. So, yeah, I'm telling you, man. It, yeah, it's, it's a trip to see when you grow your own cat. I would not have known that. Life. You taught me that. Um, you know, I always come to you when I have that one spot problem. But this was better than the first year, and this one's going to be even better than yeah, that. Exactly. Now, um, one thing that I do have to mention about when you water, you want to make sure to pH your water. Um, and the reason for that is this. So... Nutrients get absorbed. I should have paid more attention in biology class when I was in high school. There's a little bit of, a little bit of what is this, organic chemistry, I think. Maybe. Whatever it is. I, I get biology is me, right? Um, I should have paid more attention to Mr. Bellman in science. God bless Mr. <coughs> Bellman. But he did let, let us listen to the Dodger game when they were in the playoffs against the Expos. Uh, that's pretty cool. Montreal yeah, Expos. That's, that's pretty cool. That's, that's nice a, of him. That's a, that's, a good, that's a good teacher. That is a good teacher. So you're going to want to pH your water because nutrients get absorbed um, at different rates, uh, you know, uh, and, and the range that I pH my water at is between 5.5 and 6.5 because that's the safe range for most nutrients except for molybdenum. And there's a I'm going to put up a chart for you guys who are watching the video show so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, let me see if I can give me a moment. Let me see. If I can. How do you pH a plant? So they sell pH kits. One, right? You're always gonna in your pH kit. You're gonna get a pH up and a pH down. In that kit, you're also gonna get this little shot glass. You take your water. You you add your uh, I don't know your solution to check. Then you mix it, and you have a chart that tells you the range. Okay, this color means that it's low pH. This color means it's high pH. Like swimming pool water. Exactly. It's like okay. pH in your swimming pool. Okay. Um, but uh, what the easiest way to do it is to get a digital pH meter, which are not that expensive. You get a like, you know, good one, a cricket one for about, you know, 20 bucks, 22 bucks. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. That'll tell you exactly what your water is at. And then you just pH up or pH down to bring it to that 5.6. And um, that truly is going to vary everywhere you are, anywhere you're growing, because the water... The water is different everywhere, right? It is. And um, again, you're going to want to pay attention to that because most of your nutrients get absorbed in a range, you know, and that 5.5 to 6.5 is the safe range for all of them to be absorbed. If it's lower than that or higher than that, you could wind up locking out nutrients. You know, zinc might not be absorbed or uptake, and then you have a zinc deficiency and you're wondering, well, why? Then you dump a bunch of zinc in. Not thinking about your water, but if you do that, that creates whole other other issues because mm-hmm. the zinc will lock out, you know, phosphorus. You know, if you go too heavy on one or the other. So the very first thing you want to do, especially if you ever see a deficiency, is pH your water. Um, that's usually, typically, um, going to be your problem. Now, as far as deficiencies for nutrients, I would I rarely see them in plants that are grown in soil. Um, Deficiency usually show up in plants that are grown in pots. And that's because the plant and the soil are completely dependent on us. You know, it's not like they can spread their roots lower or spread them out to go looking for what they're missing. You know, if, if, they're, if it's not in the soil, if we're not putting it in, the plant's not going to get it. 
we've created its own environment in that pot and everything has to happen there. Yes. You, you are now mother nature, basically, mm -hmm. you know, you have to, yeah, you just got to make sure that they have everything that they need. Sure. Um, that's and, a lot of responsibility. Hey, you know, <laughs> you know, and again, that's why I pH not exactly to like a 5.6. I like to leave that range because the different, the different nutrients are going to be absorbed differently. You know, so if I keep it in a range, then, you know, I kind of keep everything going and moving. Um, I want to make sure I don't lock anything out. So that's why I keep it in that range. If it's a 6.3 one day that I water and, a, you know, a 5.6 another day, that's okay. Now, these are these are not details that the first time, second time grower needs to concern themselves with, is it? Or So, I mean, not really. It, it depends. It depends. Um, so the reason I bring it up is because... Cannabis seeds are a high value seed. You know, if you're buying them online, you're paying close to a hundred bucks for a good 10, 10 seeds. Um, usually if you start with a good and rich soil, a nice super soil, you're not going to run into these problems. But if you do, you know, if you're, if you come out and your plant looks wilted or you see the lower leaves turning yellow, you're going to wonder why. Mm hmm you know, and the so it's just a way to stay ahead of some of the it, issues that could develop uh, down the road. It's also a way to, to, to recognize, to be like, oh, this may come up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's and, and this happens with all plants, you know, with anything that bears fruit, your tomato plants can run into the same thing. But most of the time, tomatoes are in ground. In ground and, um, you know, you, we're not really, if they were in a container, then yes, same kind of thing. We'd make sure it have to make sure it gets a whole bunch of water because mm -hmm. those tomatoes need a bunch of water and then all the nutrients that those things are going to need. But again, that happens when you grow in containers, mm -hmm. you know, now, as far as your water, when you water, yeah, there's a lot of things, um, to think about, especially as you said, as you grow more often. You know, you, you want to pay attention to these details. You're going to be kind of curious about it. See, like, well, why did that plant yellow up or why is it wilted? Mm -hmm. You know, and these are the reasons. But yeah, um, for the most part, you don't have to. If you're a new grower, you know, you, you know, use a filtered water, but not, you know, um, reverse osmosis water. Mm -hmm. But again, doesn't, you know, those are details. And now I'm going to get into the weeds if I get into reverse osmosis water. But uh, so anyways, yeah. Well, I can see where that, you know, having just grown a, a few uh, plants myself in the, in the past two seasons, um, you, it's a personal challenge. I mean, you, you, my, my second grow was much better than my first. The buds were more formed, sure. more like, you know, and, but when tighter. they were tighter, actual buds, of, I mean, I'm actually showing them to yeah. people, right? They're not the greatest, but I do compare them to some of the other dispensary buds and they're right, pretty close, right? Oh man, don't um, even get me started. Yeah. Man. There's, there's all kinds of, I mean, in, in shop, there's all kinds of mids, you know, mid range level weed that sold at a premium that you look at and be like, really? Yeah. This is what you're going to charge me yeah. 70, 80 bucks for an yeah. egg. Um, but yeah. So yeah. that challenge, uh, you, you're challenging yourself. So you want to start doing the things that is going to improve that look eventually at the end, because that's where the payoff is. Yeah, of course. The process is beautiful. You get the aroma, the terpenes. Uh, but at the end, you say, wow, this could have been just a little bit better. Sometimes right, right. Because also at the end of that grow, you're going to be wondering, like my first time, I remember I'm looking at it like, Again, my I remember the first weed I ever grew, the buds were really long and wispy. Mm. You know, it wasn't a lot of cluster there. Sure. Not, and, yeah. and, you know, I later learned that that's a nutrient thing. You know, um, if I want a tighter bud, we can start using like, you know, some, some um, more silica, which is probably, which tightens it up, you know, which you probably, you can get from, what is it, rice husks. Mm. Also, um, I believe alfalfa does that also. Alfalfa is a natural, what's called a uh, plant growth regulator. You know, so you get a nice uniformity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So you you I, would I, put that like as a topper? Yeah, you, you put that as a top dressing. I would usually, or, you know, make a, a, a compost tea, put that, add that as, a, mm -hmm. as an ingredient to it. But like you said, it's a progression because you look at your grow and you're like, well, why doesn't my weed look like that? And you're like, then that's where you take the that's next step. That's where you step. start doing things. You know, and yeah, and that's why, I, that, you that out, but. That's why I say that, uh, you know, cannabis is a gateway plant, man. It'll teach you how to grow a garden. And it's amazing that they can, they can get the, these uh, commercial cultivators 
can get that on a large scale. I went to that grow last well, week, and, I mean, and it's more challenging. Well, I mean, there's, but there's because when I was walking through the grow, there were some beautiful plants, and there was one some not so. Well, sure, and, and of course. But they they're trying, but it's difficult, man. Well, when you, you know, and also controlled conditions. those are those are so the way most commercial grows happen is they go, you know, they they use nutrient salts, you know. Whereas the way I grow is more of a biological system, mm -hmm. you know, a lot a lot of uh, of soil amendments. Mm -hmm. Commercial grows, you need that turnover every 30 days. Sure, they're not doing soil amendments, they're doing it through their irrigation. Right, they're doing it through the irrigation, they're doing a lot of bottle nutrients, you know, yeah. that's how you do it, that's how they maintain it. They've got yeah, the they, had, they had a main tank, and that, that, the guy was using his, uh, that's how he was using his, his foam, yeah, to regulate seeing sure. the readings, and he could adjust and, everything. And, and that's that. how they do it, and that's how they, they, but, you know, there is a difference there, though, um, between... A weed that's grown throughout a season, and then weed that's turned over every eight weeks. They harvest that's... every week. Oh yeah, no, I mean, every I know, I, I know a couple of operations that harvest. They were telling me eleven thousand plants a week, hmm. and that's how many clones they bring in, also. That's and you incredible. can tell, yeah, I was like eleven thousand. I'm like, that's a lot of fucking weed, and that's just one operation. Get it while you can, America, because once Mexico and uh, South America comes legal, they're going to do the same thing well, that they know, did to the flower market, the but, regular flower. But see, here's the problem with that, though. Here's the problem with that. Yes, um, but then you have to convince convince our government to allow those imports. You know, yeah, I mean, because I, I hear a lot about, oh, yeah, South America. And, and, and it's true. South America, Colombia can grow a gram of weed for like 52 cents. Right. Whereas, you know. Are we going to allow it in? Where, where, are well, we going to allow it in? Whereas, so where, whereas I'm like sure in Canada. We allowed Corona in. We allowed uh, other European beers in. Uh, yeah, there, but there'll be a way. It's heavily tariffed. Right? Sure. There'll, yeah. there'll be a way oh, to yeah. bring in that. Uh, 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 some of those Colombian strains that you, you can't get a hold of or because of where they grow, it's it's uh, um, it's worth it to somebody to pay yeah. that those those prices to, to to have it in. Well, and then and then there again, that means that if I'm a cannabis mango beach, mango, be hey, man, I'll take that mango all day long. Um, so but then it, then that goes to me if I'm a cannabis producer, cultivator. Um, is large scale really going to be the way to go in the future? Or am I going to have to kind of pare down and do this little boutique kind of flavor? I think boutique you know, will you're, always you're be coming in a viable part of the industry because of where, because of how the, you know, the Appalachian uh, differences throughout the state with how things are grown. I'm, you know, cannabis mm -hmm. here in, on our coastal area prop is, is, is unique because of how the weather is. Um, it ha it can resist certain things and is more delicate on in other in other things. So, um, unlike beer, you know, beer or alcohol, that's just a distillery and a, a process of what you know. They're not they're not creating anything other than a flavor. Whereas cannabis is it's it's of the earth, so the earth is going to dictate how it is. So that boutique is always going. to, I hope it will always have a. Uh, a, a mainstay in the industry because you can't recreate something on a large scale. Well, you know, I, I, I hope it's, I hope it also stays in the industry as well because it's also one of the cool things to see when you go and you travel around to different places, mm. you know, just to see what popular there, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think boutique is, is definitely going to be more visible, you know, especially, let's say, 10 years from now. And like you say, hopefully – we get all these imports from other countries, you know, Portugal, Mexico, Colombia. You know, yeah, let's try weed from around the world. You know? Sure. You know, I, I I definitely subscribe to that box. You know how they have like fucking steak of the month club. Sure. Butt of the month club from around the world. That would be on, great. Man. That'd be that'd be cool. Yeah. You know. Uh, now a couple of little notes about um, just some nutrients, and these are what are known as the macronutrients, the main nutrients. Now, depending on who you read. There's three to five. I'm just going to cover three because those are mostly what you're going to see on your your nutrient packages, which is NPK, you know, which is your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. Those are the three big ones that are always going to be on, on your soil. They're going to be on your soil amendments. They're going to be on any bottle nutrients that you grab off the shelf. So now nitrogen is, is necessary mostly because it makes chlorophyll. 
well, you know, it's necessary for a lot of things, but uh, one of the main things it does, it makes chlorophyll, which you need for photosynthesis. Um, because without the chlorophyll, without that photosynthesis, the plant cannot take the energy from the sun and keep it and turn it, well, take the heat and the, and the rays and turn it into energy. You know, and the nitrogen is really what's going to help build um, the framework for your, 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 the root system, for the branches, for the stems, for, for everything, you know, for all of that. Uh, so that's why you need nitrogen in, that's why the cannabis uses so much nitrogen in all phases of growth. And now, it's going to use most of the nitrogen in veg. When your plant goes into, and that's because, again, it's building all of this infrastructure for the flowering process. Once your plant goes into flowering, it's mainly going to just use that nitrogen for photosynthesis because everything's already built. You know, your root system's there. You've already started to flower. So your nitrogen gets dialed back. That's why when you go into flowering, a lot of your bloom boosters are low in nitrogen, but high in phosphorus and high in, in potassium. Because those are the elements that it's going to use now more to build that flower, to build those trichomes, to, to make those compounds. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so then the next one, your, your P, out of the MPK, is your phosphorus. Uh, now, the phosphorus is there to help change that energy. One of the things it does is it helps change the energy into sugar. You know, because those sugars are going to be used for all kinds of different things. But your main thing your phosphorus is doing is, is, is taking that energy from the sun and turning it into sugar, hanging onto it in the sugar. You know. Now, the last one, the K, the potassium, what it's going to do is it's going to take those sugars and it's going to change them into, you know, amino acids or other carbohydrates to be used throughout the plant, you know, to help grow that root system, to kind of fill in that, uh, that infrastructure. Potassium is going to help with also how uh, water is distributed throughout the plant. It really helps that vascular system. You know, again, it's going to help with drought. It's going to help with the, with your uh, freezing, you know, freezing seasons or with freezing temperatures. If that happens, if you get a cold snap. Um, so yeah, those are the important. Those are your three main why they're important. Your NPKs. You know, your your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. All intertwined so that the plant can grow to its potential. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's amazing the way you see the progression of, of what nitrogen does. It, it actually helps to capture that energy. And then the, the, the phosphorus is going to change that energy into something that it can use. And then the potassium is there to just actually, all right, you guys are going here, you guys are going there, and this is what we're doing. You know? mm. uh, now, the last thing I want to talk about as far as your plant for this part of... Um, your plant in the vegetative stage is part one is some pest control as uh, you know, since your plants are pretty young, you're going to start to, you should start thinking about pest control. How are you going to help um, actually bring in some biological predators? The easiest way I would, I would recommend is to get some uh, wildflower mix planted throughout your garden, you know, in some, you know, bald spots of your garden, just put down some wildflower mix. That'll bring in some beneficial predators Either it's going to bring it in because of the bright colors, or either it's going to bring it in with the with the pollen. A lot of the adults, like the lace wings, they they're not so much after pests as much as they are after the pollen. So they're not the best predators. Adult lace wings. The real predators for for lace wings would be lace wing larvae. And I usually buy those. You know, I'll, I'll go to the insectary and pick those up at Rincon and the um, Vitova insectary. But those are the real, you know, voracious, the real hungry predators are the larvae. Are the larvae, yeah, in the larvae stage. You know, so um and yeah, wildflowers are great to bring in just natural natural predators for your pests. Uh, they love vibrant colors. So, yeah, man, plant those flowers around. You know? And I, I planted uh, kale, kale Russian red, red kale. Red kale really That uh, was serving as a bait plant, and it made a difference from the first grow and the second grow. First grow, I had some problems with some moths, and the second one, not any at all. Yeah, you know, and that's another thing, too, is um, red kale is good for that. Green beans are good for that, too. Um, green beans are actually good for, as a bait plant, 
for the two for the two spotted spider mite, the little red spider mites that you'll see climbing mm -hmm. around sometimes, because they're going to also show. Not only are they going to attract those, the the bean plant is more attractive to them than your cannabis plant. Not to say that they don't like your cannabis plant, but if there's beans involved, they'll go to the beans first. Mm. And the bean plant will show any kind of um, mite stress pressure before your cannabis does. It shows up really quickly. You know, so you can say, oh, shit. And, you know, since typically when I plant them, I plant them in small pots, I can just move them away from the plant. Sure. Because, uh, yeah, it's a very fine line between um, a bait plant and a banker plant to where they're just like, hey, we love it here. They just start colonizing it. Um, yeah, I've had that happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it happens so fast. It, oh, <laughs> it, it, it really does. Uh, another good thing that I use, not as much, but I have used it, is, is neem oil. Um, the only thing is that you have to remember when you use neem, don't use it when the plants are in direct sunlight. Well, a any kind of really foliar spray. And that's mostly because the water droplets, they can turn into magnifying glasses and they'll wind up burning, they'll put these little burn spots on your plant. The first time it happened to me, I didn't know, I thought it was a pest. So that sent me into a weird fucking swirl because i was sure. like oh shit so then i bombarded it um tried to feed it all kinds of, and, and it, it got worse it got worse <laughs> the, the plant really hated me um it, that plant was mad at me yeah uh and then someone finally told me it's like no dude you sprayed it in the daytime and that's right. what happened and i was it like turned into little well, magnifying glasses fuck, okay yeah plant. um that plant didn't survive by the way. yeah uh yeah a after i took the yeah, I just <laughs> well down here where I grow. I know you grow up in Ohio. I grow up down here in the you know we're lower sea level, and in the morning here it can be pretty moist. Uh, uh, and so I'll shake a plant, just knock the water off, just because I don't want it sitting oh, on yeah. there. Um, but I, and I have to do that pretty much every morning. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um, what else was I going to say, dude? Oh, uh, so another thing about the neem is that you don't want to use it. I mean, if you're just using it to just for pest control, if you don't have any kind of really heavy pest pressure or infestation, you want to use it about once every week, once every 10 days, because the neem does, it will strip away that waxy layer on top of the leaf surface. Right. You know, that Which wax, has its use as well. It, that, it is part of the, 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 the leaf's defense. Mm -hmm. It is part mm -hmm. of the plant's defense. But it's also one of the reasons why neem is so good for, for pests is because it doesn't allow the pests to harden up and it does strip that cuticle layer off of them. So it makes them more susceptible to disease. Mm. But again, if you go too heavy or go too often, you're going to strip that wax layer off. And also another thing, if you go too often or too heavy, you're also going to basically eradicate any, if you have any good biological predators in there. You know, so you got to be aware of that. Um, as far as biological predators go, please understand that it is not a quick fix. It's going to take those predators a few days to get control of whatever you've got going on. It's not like you're going to release lacewing larvae and the next day your, your spider mite problem is going to go away. It's going to take them a little while. And we have the, you know, we have a uh, recon vitova right here. What what does somebody do if they're in a, they don't have an insectary available? I'm so, I mean, them online. you you yeah. can. You, you can go to rinconvitova.com. You can absolutely go over there. Um, they have a great website. Um, they have a great website, man. A lot of really good information. Go over there. They have a resource to where you can look up either the pest you have or the predator that you want. You know, which really helps. Um, but yeah, online, order it online. If you're if you're not in the states, like if you're in Europe, yeah, try to find. There should be some European insectaries because they do not allow insects to go through customs. It's mm. hard to get insects either. It's hard to get insects into Hawaii. Yeah. What is that? I'm showing you a, that looks a like picture a, I took of a bug that I found on a, on a plant, and. Um, it looks a little bit like a lacewing larva. It's hard to tell. I don't yeah. know what that is. It was, it was probably an eighth of an inch in size, and there were a, a lot of them on this one particular plant. Huh. So I, uh, not knowing if they were beneficial, they don't oh, look too beneficial. Kill them. <laughs> we kill had em. to get rid of them. Yeah, if you yeah. don't know. Um, God, you know what? And I'm going to try to look up. There's, there is a website that helps you identify pests or, sure. and identify insects, Sure, I should say. 
I'll try yeah, to because you put so much out. time and money and energy into the plant, and for a pest to come through and just mow it down, uh, it, it really it does really hurt. So, um, getting to know what your garden is, what's in it, uh, the other plants that are going, you know, cannabis is that gateway plant. In that you start growing other things around, and why not grow things that are going to help you know benefit the plant plus. Um, other plants that you just yeah. may want to grow for for food, exactly. and um, it, I, that happened to me. I grew started with the cannabis, and then I went into cucumbers and uh, peppers, and now you have a farm uh, stand. Tomatoes, okay. three types of tomatoes, and yeah, it's 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 great. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's okay. it's it's um, and it, it, you do create this nice little ecosystem wherever it is, and um, it's um, you 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 feel a little happier. <laughs> Well, it's also a sense of satisfaction because I remember like when you told me, like when you showed me this jar first um, over the phone, I didn't realize that was what you had grown. And I had asked you, hey, you know, once you said that was yours, you know how nice that feels, man, to open a jar of your own stuff and say, you know what, I'm going to smoke my own shit today. You yeah, know? yeah. Because that, uh, yeah, that is a sense of accomplishment, man. It makes you sure, feel good. Sure. It makes you feel good. Uh, well, brothers and sisters, um, that is the end of my notes for uh, the cannabis plant in the vegetative stage, part one. Next couple of weeks, we'll get to part two. I'm not sure what I'm going to put in there, but it'll be something. All right. Now, don't forget to leave a uh, comment and a rating wherever you uh, listen to podcasts. Uh, go to inmygrow.com and subscribe to the website. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel. That is youtube.com slash show. And as always, I want to thank all the artists who let me use their music to put the show together. Rodney, thank you very much for coming back. Thank you, man, show, for having man. me. That was awesome. My time here. All right, brothers and sisters. Well, um, that's it. You know, I love you all very much. And remember to always grow, learn, and teach.